Okay, so for today, our topic is Thomas Aquinas and his, his natural theology and, and what he does with the problem of evil, and more generally what philosophers have done with, with the problem of evil. Now, just by way of, of a quick review, last time we talked about Thomas Aquinas' use of, of what we call natural reason. That is, focusing not just as Plato did on some kind of invisible realm of eternal ideas or something, but following Aristotle's model of focusing on the visible world, the, the kinds of places where things change and where from Aristotle's purpose you could often understand something best by understanding in terms of its purpose or, or its end. Uh, Aristotle had theorized along the way about an unmoved mover, uh, for, which for him was the cause of motion in the universe. He, uh, Aristotle's argument went something like this. Motion is real. Uh, experience teaches us things only move when something else moves them. It does not make sense, Aristotle thought, to, to, to imagine that motion could be understood as an infinite regress, that there were always things moving. Uh, he thinks there therefore must have been some initial movement. And so he focuses on the source of that movement and says for that to make sense, it would have to be a mover not moved by any other mover, and so an unmoved mover. And for Aristotle now, this was not a personal being uh, li like many Christians uh, think of in terms of God. For Aristotle, this, this unmoved mover was sort of a perfect realm in which perfections within itself were regarded by this unmoved mover, this, this, this abstract sphere on the outside fringes of society. But Thomas Aquinas followed Aristotle's model and, and came up with those five ways that we looked at last time for, for focusing on the ways of arguing about the existence of God. Get them in the same order here that we had in, in the notes last time. Um, the first three, uh, pretty well uh, capturing a, a, an Aristotelian point of view in, in terms of what kind of cause might be out there. But then with these other two, beginning to make more room for things that are important in, in Christian theology, things, things about the character of this originating force or, or this this one who provides all this uh, motion or causation or purpose or whatever that uh, are susceptible of a little more theological content. Now today what we're going to do is look at some of the philosophical responses to, to Thomas Aquinas' attempt to, uh, to do this kind of natural theology or natural philosophy. And so there are several things to be said. One about these arguments is that it does not appear that these kinds of arguments make believers out of non-believers. They are not persuasive at that level, at least in terms of how we see them function, uh, social functions where we, for which we have evidence. But it is very clear that people who already believe love these arguments. <laughs> they latch onto them in a hurry as a way of expressing, I believe, uh, some of the things that are already on their mind, of relating some important theological concepts to one another in, in ways that are often new and interesting for them to do. But there raised, is raised then in our textbook the, the issue about how this relates to science. And Socio tries to compare what Thomas and people like him are up to to what scientists are up to and suggests that there are some still, still some very important differences between natural science as we know it on the one hand and natural philosophy or natural theology of the sort we see with Thomas and other people. Scientists, he points out, work to try to clarify the way things work in this world which we know. Uh, they do not hypothesize about why there is this world that we know, why there is something rather than nothing. They claim no access to resources that would provide an answer to that kind of question, the question why there is a reality to begin with. And yet we know theologians do that sort of thing all the time. 
Now, when theologians try to answer that question, why is there something and not nothing, they use traditional sources of revelation and, and theology within their own tradition. Uh, and, and Socio asks us then whether Thomas might have been projecting his own sense of order onto reality and thus coming up with this notion that because it seems so orderly and well designed, there must have been an intelligent designer at its source. Now, I remember the first time I saw where Socio did that, I wrote in the margin something like that. Well, of course he did. Because, in fact, it would seem that all of us project ourselves all of the time. Because we know ourselves better than we know anything else. And one of, the, one of the interesting things about religious language in general is that it's not a separate language. In religious writing and conversation, we adapt the terms the, from the everyday world in figurative ways to express important conclusions. For example, think about all the words we use to describe God. Uh, descriptions of God as, as king of the universe or as judge of those who are good and wicked, uh, God as father, uh, God as a warrior leading his people, God as an intelligent designer, all of those depend on languages which contain uh, meaningful terms to start with. If you don't know what a father is, you won't have much of an idea of what people are trying to get at when they describe their God as Father. Now, to note that doesn't undermine any of these arguments. It, it merely reminds us how language works, that we move from one, as, as Wittgenstein would say, language game to another by adapting familiar terms and applying them analogically or in some other figurative way. Uh, language works that way. Robert Burns, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. And it's not really about roses and music. I mean, only the most simplistic concepts in the world are expressed in literal, unique terms. But there's another really big problem in all of this that's occupied philosophers and theologians for a long time and, and, and most people who would not count themselves as philosophers or theologians. One of the most significant problems in dealing with this kind of thought is coming up with some satisfactory accounting for the presence of evil. If God has created everything that is, why do so many innocent people suffer? And Socio puts it this way. You see it on page 249 there. If God can prevent the suffering of the innocent and yet chooses not to, he is not good. If God chooses to prevent suffering but cannot, he is not omnipotent or all-powerful. If God cannot recognize the suffering of the innocent, God is not wise. Now that's the way this dilemma or trilemma is posed by socio. People have phrased it in other similar kinds of ways. In other words, it is difficult to use all of the superlative attributes traditionally associated with the nature of God without it becoming difficult <coughs> to understand evil and, and suffering. If you're willing to say that God is not, say, all-powerful, but only more powerful than any other being, you may find a loophole in that. Uh, process uh, theologians uh, like the notion of saying that God is, is either not all-powerful or not all-knowing. If you, if you say that God's knowledge is limited, you, you've, got, you've got a little wiggle room for yourself here. If you believe that descriptions of God as good and loving are naive in the face of traditions about God's wrath and God's judgment, then part of that question may be dissolved for you. But none of those three claims is easy for, for believers. Did God create evil is one form the question takes. <laughs> 
And if not, what sort of being could create evil? And did God create the being who created evil? And the questions just pile up on top of one another. Did God produce evil beings? This is where Thomas Aquinas responded uh, by responses he borrowed from other people and, and amplified them. And one of the keys is this. Uh, he took an old notion that perhaps evil is not an actual thing that exists, but evil represents a privation or an absence of goodness, a lack of goodness. Not a positive thing, but something missing which might be there in any situation. And further said that the absence of good is an essential part of most of the processes that we know that are designed to achieve good. Especially if anything like the normal growth of our bodies and minds is to be expected. Especially if we take into account the freedom that we like to think that we have. The freedom to set goals and to accomplish them. Or to accomplish goals set for us by others whom we trust. The uniqueness of all great writers and musicians uh, and the like stems from how they have striven to achieve those goals once they have adopted them. The, those ends, the, those purposes, the, the telos in, in Aristotle's term that, that directs their lives. And Thomas cannot imagine any way that without growth and change and the freedom to engage in that, that we can imagine most of the good things that we know. The alternative to the absence of every evil we know is to make us into completely determined beings, acting out an old script or controlled by someone else. No problems, no pain, no worries, no striving, having all one needs for happiness, but that produces its own kind of odd puzzle. People like to imagine what, uh, what the perfect afterlife would be like. And, and th the problem arises again. Would all your needs be met? If so, would you be a static being with no more purposes to pursue, no more development, no new songs to learn, no new poems to write, no new relationships to develop and grow richer, everything sort of fixed and static in, in some allegedly perfect way. And that is not appealing to us uh, uh, for the most part either. The other thing I mentioned last time that, that becomes a problem, and we don't have a full treatment of that here, is the accusation that comes usually from outside religions, but then it's taken up seriously by theologians, uh, the problem of hell, which often turns up in, in philosophy of religion books in, in the chapter on the problem of evil. Uh, the notion, and this is what I asked you uh, a couple of days ago, if hell is conceived as a place where people are tortured endlessly, and there's no hope that that torturing or punishment can accomplish anything, then we ask what kind of being designs it and whether that's justifiable. And it was in the face of that that a number of theologians over the years responded by saying, no, that does not make sense from a Christian perspective, and came up with several options, uh, one of which was that perhaps this hell should be understood as a figure of speech, meaning to exist completely apart from the presence of God. And one way to accomplish that would be that when God resurrects all the good and faithful people, you are not resurrected, but allowed with some compassion in mind to remain non-existent for eternity and thus not be tortured or punished. Thinking that, that the lack of eternal consciousness in the presence of God was punishment enough in itself. The other thing some of the Christians did early on was to take some remarks in the New Testament and in the Apostles' Creed about Jesus' uh, time between the crucifixion and the resurrection, those three days. Uh, the Apostles' Creed says, and sort of using resources from the New Testament, that he descended into hell and was there three days. And theologians have tried to explain that as the time that Jesus went to, to redeem all those who had died as people of faith, but in a pre-Christian era, folks like Abraham and Moses and so on, you know. 
but also other theologians trying to expand that to suggest that, well, maybe people being tortured might change their mind and be redeemable and ready to respond. But we've heard so much uh, about your state at the moment of your death being the only determining factor that a whole host of theologians uh, resist that sort of reinterpretation of those old figures of speech. And so then we're back to the question of if it does not have a good end, a good purpose to accomplish, can it be counted as part of a good universe and can the one who created it be seen as good? Now those are sort of the main questions. Any thoughts or responses about those that you'd like to throw in? Maybe a They go to, <laughs> the question is, what about people who, who at the last moment are, are different from the way they have been for a long time? Should that last moment be the determining factor? Yeah, that was sort of another version of, of what I was pointing to. Any responses on that? I, I, there's a funny story I heard of, of a fellow named Clarence Jordan, who uh, back in the 1940s, with his PhD in Greek in hand, moved down to America's Georgia, Georgia this is the uh, 1940s, I imagine, and in southern Georgia started an interracial farming commune. Well, that got him in trouble with a whole lot of folks in Georgia and Alabama and northern Florida, as you can imagine. But one of the things he did was to translate the New Testament into the southern idiom. They're called the Cotton Patch Gospels, and he got some of the letters in other books, too. But he was a very uh, interesting speaker, and I, I, I still remember one time he was, he was calling into question this notion that, that your state at the moment of death really fit the kind of the New Testament redemptive process as he understood it. And, and this is the way he told the story. He could imagine some old fellow who's been off to a revival at his church and he's heard the preacher and the preacher's been telling him it's time to repent and change your ways and profess your faith. And he's, he's, he doesn't do it that night. He's not quite ready, but he's driving home and he's, he's praying about it and he's thinking about it and he's just at the point where he's prepared to commit himself. But he's so preoccupied with that he gets in front of the train and the train hits him and he's gone and that was too late, you know. And, and because preachers have often stood up and said something like that, you know, that sounded like a, a, a kind of a common realistic interpretation one might encounter. And, and his response to that was that God, his God was more powerful than that train. And, and the momentary actions of that train and the consequences of that train could not count as being more powerful than God. Surely there was some way for the redemptive processes of God to reach beyond that point. Now, when he puts it that way, people who are really concerned to preserve God's power hear something that they might be able to respond to in some favorable way there. Uh, but we also know that kind of the traditional interpretations that have used uh, fear and threats and so on to, to get people to go ahead and profess just as soon as possible. Um, and, and coupled also with the various interpretations of baptism. You know, for many Christians, the baptism itself is essential. And, and without that, and that's, why, that's why most Christians baptize infants, because they interpret or have interpreted the baptism itself as essential. And uh, figure baptize them now, teach them later. You know, but they become part of the family of God then. So that, that, that timing is important <coughs> to a whole lot of people in a variety of ways. Yeah. Any other... Uh, Helpful, hard questions here for us to consider. <laughs> yes, please. With hell, mm -hmm. if I, I'm really unfamiliar with the whole story, but I'm under the impression that God sent Satan to hell and said, here, you can go here, you have this, and take care of all of this stuff because nobody wants it because it's terrible there. So if that's what happened, then wouldn't he doing that than giving power to evil? Yeah, and, and then you get back into that whole puzzle that I was just sort of vaguely indicating with my questions when I asked, did God create evil or did God create the beings who created evil? Because if, um, to the extent that, that humans are created 
imperfect, with a lot of lacks. Thomas thinks that's okay because our understanding of human life is it's all about setting goals and achieving them, and you wouldn't have that if we were created perfect. But if you start out with some and try to tie the Old Testament stories about other beings besides humans and, and how they function through the Bible, and if you, if you go through that interpretation that the one named Satan was a good but obviously flawed being who fell and then became the leader of an empire of evil, then, then you face uh, that, that problem in, I, I guess, a similar way. Uh, because you're talking about a being with freedom, uh, with certain privations, as Thomas would say, who responds in, in freedom rather badly, just like people we know respond often badly in their freedom. Uh, but in that way, in a way that does a lot of harm to others. Yeah. That's why he created, you know, everybody mm -hmm. to have free will so that, you know, you could choose to love him, you know. Because if, if he had just programmed everybody, you know, to be perfect, then, you know, yeah. you wouldn't be able to love. It would, it would automatically be programmed in. Right, right. right. L love as we know it, yeah. Requiring some kind of freedom. Uh, we, we, we sometimes wonder what, how, to make, how to take account of the commands to love. You know, love your neighbor. You know? <laughs> uh, is, it, is it an absolute requirement or is it an ideal held before you or what? Uh, and wondering how love, as we think of it, with a lot of not, not just doing good things, but having emotions that make it seem to be a good thing to do, can be <laughs> commanded like that. And, and the reason we have that problem is because we, we can't imagine only loving because we have been commanded to love. That, that love is something that seems, as, as we understand it, to flow freely out of our decisions and commitments and goals and relationships and all that. And um, so not the sort of thing you could easily zap into people without sacrificing a lot of what we think of as, as human freedom, human accomplishment, and growth, all those kinds of things. And, and Aristotle was just much more so than Plato was particularly concerned to take account of uh, the changes that we undergo individually and, and together in our societies. And uh, Plato was Plato was satisfied with having a, a kind of an abstract ideal in another realm. Some of us reflect it better than others, but Aristotle thought that those forms were here in our midst, and we could see them being well fulfilled in some places and rather poorly fulfilled in others. And and, uh, and we did so by abstracting them and comparing them and talking about them and maybe seeing how they work out in our lives and the lives of those we know. Kind of an experimental approach to life. And that seems, in many respects, uh, much more realistic to many of us. Um, well, of course, we have the test on Monday, but in the class after that, let me tell you what we're going to do uh, starting Wednesday next week. We're going now, having figured out sort of what philosophy is in Europe, you know, in the Western world, with these ancient, uh, with, a, with a sampling of some of the important ancient medieval philosophers, we're going we're to turn the camera around to Asia, and we're going to look at some Asian thinkers. They are not typically philosophers in the same sense as Western philosophers. Uh, some of them get to be associated with religious traditions more so than Western philosophers. And so Socio calls them sages to differentiate them from the, the sophoi of, of the Western um, uh, areas where philosophy is done. So, but anyway, they, they, oh, the term philosophy is often used to talk about uh, the teachings of Lao Tzu and Confucius and Buddha. And uh, while it doesn't mean exactly the same thing, the fact that in, in several different places, the same term philosophy is used for both. We'll, we'll see how they compare to, to what's done in this part of the world. So we'll do that next week. Thank you.